Thanks for joining us for the Long Island Sound Podcast. Each week we explore new music and dive deeper with the artists and their stories behind the music. Please subscribe and rate and review us wherever you stream this podcast. Here's your host, Steve Yusko. Welcome to another episode of the Long Island Sound. I'm so excited to bring you the guest that I spoke to today. His name is Matt Stoll. He's from Babylon originally, a really great singer-songwriter. You're going to enjoy the conversation that we had today, but you're also going to really love his music. We got deep into his lyrics. I think it's going to touch your heart the way it touched mine. Take a listen to his song, I Am Free. I'm a walking light It started when I was younger Just cruising night I didn't know what was coming And I didn't know why Around age 15 I learned to love The castle Just another day Stuck inside these four walls There's no escape Didn't know what was coming And I didn't know when Around age 30 I learned to break The castle Uh, it's Steve Yusko with another episode of the Long Island Sound Podcast, and I'm really excited about my next guest, Matt Stoll. At one, because I found out he's actually uh, grew up in my hometown, Babylon, here, and uh, so we get to talk about things we know, and we get to talk about our love of music. So with that, I welcome you, Matt Stoll, to the Long Island Sound Podcast. So good to have you here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so I just you know what it's so wacky. I don't even remember how we we got connected. I think I s- kept on seeing you pop up on Facebook. Okay, um, you do I, you do a lot of social media as far as um, yes. throwing songs out there. Yeah, um, I'm very social media heavy. Um, you know, I think it stems from uh, you know my little bit of stage fright. <laughs> you know, when it comes <laughs> to performing, um, but I also um, you go know, I've was in other older. Uh, Years ago, I was in other bands, um, mm-hmm. and then I started doing my own thing, and I think that's kind of where I got started. Um, and I think it's a little, it's a little bit harder to kind of be in front, um, you know. Where I've always just wanted to be a songwriter, 
Um, so I think it's more comfortable for me to sort of post on social media than to go out and perform and go to open mics and things like that. Yeah. You know, you know, it's funny. It's, it's, I, I had done a little promo piece that I got from a friend of mine. I saw him, this guy named Chris Marshak, who was uh, on this, uh, one of our guests, drummer, producer, great guy. And he had a videographer who would videotape him and he would talk about drumming and percussion. And he was, you know, he's, ta- he's talking to somebody and I'm like, Oh, I really like that. And then I started, you know, faking it by, you know, looking off to the side and saying, eh, you know, answering your question. And I'm and in a room totally by myself, you know. <laughs> and, and my wife is like, oh, who are you talking to? Oh, my favorite person, myself, you know. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's really a weird adjustment uh, to do that. But it's, it's interesting in a way because you have control, I guess. Maybe that, that's the way. I don't know if that's for you. Yeah, but... I, no, 100%. I mean, you know, I deal with a lot of anxiety. So to have any kind of control over any situation I'm going to, you know, sort of lean towards. And, uh, you know, I think social media, it's a lot easier to to have that control. Yeah. Agreed. So let's do this. Let's reel back the pages. I'm always interested. One, the the reason why I put this podcast together was, Hey, what's the story behind this gal or that guy? You know, how did they learn, you know, learn their craft, woodshed their craft? Where did it all begin for you, Matt? When did you pick up an instrument? Um, Yeah. It's it's a it's a funny story and I, I feel like it's not a um, a typical like you know normal story because I, I you know it was uh, one Christmas um, I had asked for a laptop and okay. my brother was had asked for an electric guitar and the and you know towards the end of we're opening up presents and you know my parents kind of like okay that's it you know kind of joking and oh, yeah. you know then that. they had the, the the big ones that we wanted that year you know the big presents that we wanted. Um, you know, they, they sort of took out of the closet and, you know, I had my laptop and I was happy. And then my brother comes out with this guitar and the case. And I was just like, I just made the biggest mistake of my life. <laughs> just seeing it, you know, just, just something clicked in me. Um, when I saw it, that was like, that's, you know, I, I you know, I was just kind of totally blindsided by it. You know, it was like this, that's what I want to do. I want to be a guitar player. Wow. Now what, what age was that? Uh, about uh i was maybe 13 14 at the okay. time all right so that, that's know? a that's a good time to yeah. get obsessed about something so uh so what'd you do steal steal your brother's guitar i, I did i well it's, good man, I, you know right? i would you know because he you know he was one of the popular kids so he would always be out you know and in, in high school hanging out with people so there was plenty of time for me to kind of sneak at his room and play the guitar and uh, you know like, that's kind of how i started teaching myself and Um, you know, the, I know a lot of, um, musicians, they talk about how they've, uh, wanted to play, you know, all like the other, all these great band songs and they wanted to learn all the songs, how to play guitar. For me, I I just wanted to write my own songs. I don't know what I, what it was about writing that I just felt like I wanted to do. Um, but there was something to me that was just like, I want to be a songwriter. I want to keep just writing songs. Um, I never really had interest in, you know, playing other people's songs. I think not that, you know, I was like, <laughs> not that I was knocking on anything or, or, sure, or sure. you know, it was more of just like, how could I ever, you know, recreate something that is so great that they have accomplished or they've done. Um, so and I was like, I want to do it my own way. Um, and that was always a big thing for me was just, I want to be a songwriter. Well, you know, what's, you know, what's interesting to me about that is, you know, when I was learning, I was self-taught. And I did the three chords, mm-hmm. and I put the guitar down for 10 years because it was just too <laughs> damn hard for me. And then, uh, you know, guitar tabs came out, and if somebody yeah. can show me something, I can get it. And eventually I took some lessons to learn learn the neck a little bit better and, and try to get into a better practice of of doing it, you know. And But, I, you know, the, you bring up a good point in wanting to do your own thing because I always got frustrated in trying to emulate my favorite artists and play their music. Right. Not knowing about singing in different keys mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, what what's the key I, my voice should sing in. I discovered right. that that late in life. So um, it's in, you have an interesting starting point. Wait, you, now, did you do creative writing or, or is this just something in you that really yeah. pointed to song? I, I told, you know, it's funny because when I was a kid, my, my favorite books were the Lord of the Rings books. Okay. And I know, you know, J.R.R. Tolkien went, went to Oxford and, and, and for – 
you know, as a kid living on Long Island, you know, I always tell my family, I'm going to be an author. I'm going to go to Oxford. I'm going to go to these schools. I'm going to go do these things um, and be a writer. And I think that's kind of a lot of where that came in to where I got a little bit older and I saw that guitar, the two things just kind of clicked, you know, nice. I'm going to be a songwriter. Um, I did feel like I was always a, kind of a shy kid. Um, I kept to myself most of the time. And I think something about writing and, you know, songwriting just helped me open up a little bit and uh, allowed me to say what I was, what I wanted to say, you know, so, with, um, so on yeah, that note, ahead. would you, would you peg yourself as, as more of an introvert per se? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting. And I, I, I took this kind of a course with my wife about, and it was given by a guy who is a proclaimed introvert who was doing public speaking, which was fascinating to me about mm-hmm. that. And he gave us a really good perspective about, and there's different scales of people being introvert or ex- extrovert, certainly. But he said, you know, if you look at an introvert, they're kind of, measuring what their response is going to be and they're waiting on the right question to answer right where me uh, you know i have diarrhea of the mouth and i'm talking about you know there's no stopping it just kind of flows out <laughs> i've gotten better i've gotten better maybe that's podcasting is a, a good tool for me but oh, that, absolutely that helped me so much in yeah. that when i've met people who not that you i mean come on we all size people up right yes. i'm like okay i'm not i'm not asking the right things mm-hmm. I'm, you know uh, and and i and i had a an acquaintance over my wife's one one thanksgiving and you know i was like asking all the right questions in my mind nothing nothing's coming back and i'm like wow this is really uncomfortable for both of us probably not for him for me <laughs> and then i hit on something which had to do with his work and it was like the floodgates opened yeah of, of his response now now this is a left field thing when you develop the muse or develop an idea, is that the same thing that is wired in your head as far as how does the creativity flow out for you? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's definitely easier. Um, I think where, I mean, I, I feel like I've always been a creative person. Okay. Um, and I think that's always been my sort of way to communicate, um, at least to the, you know, to the best of, uh, you know, to the best of my ability. Sure. Um, you know, I feel like uh, it was always uh, a thing where I'm constantly in my, he- my own head. And how do I get these things out? Um, and that, that's kind of where it started um, was writing. Cool. Why don't we do this? Let's just take a quick break. Sure. And when we come back from the break, I really want to talk about the song Where It's Quiet, which is kind of an interesting bookend to our to our, our conversation, you know, <laughs> Where the Mind is Quiet. And I want to talk about that song, how that was developed. So uh, sure. ha- hang with us, everybody. We're with my Babylon buddy, Matt Stoll, <laughs> and we'll be right back. Hang with us, everybody. Hi, Steve Yusko from Gig Destiny here. Well, as you're probably listening to this podcast, you're probably thinking about that musician who would make a fantastic guest here on the Long Island Sound. Well, we'd like to hear their story. We'd like to hear their music. So have them reach out to us at gigdestiny.com and we'll explore their craft. Now, back to our podcast. Hey, we are back. This is Steve Yusko, your not-so-humble host for the Long Island Sound, and we're with Matt Stoll, And Matt, hey, I got to listen, and I do a little bit of my homework, and I listen to the artists that I have, and I was listening to your stuff, and you know, I was thinking all these different um, voices uh, of different bands that you remind me of. I'm not going to say who it is at this moment, but there's some things that kind of came into mind. So before I ask you about the song, Where It's Quiet, I want to ask you about the progression of okay, you settled in that, man, you want to be a songwriter and you want to go to Oxford, okay, as a young, as a young man. <laughs> and where did it go to finding your, your voice or how you sing and go about that? And um, was that a new venture to you uh, as a 13-year-old, 14-year-old, as far as singing goes? Yeah, um, I mean, it was a lot of trial and error. 
Okay. Um, you know, I don't consider myself a trained vocalist at all. Um, you know, I, you know, did chorus in high school for maybe, you know, two years, something like that. Mm -hmm. I never really had interest in singing, you know, um, I always felt like, uh, you know, expressing yourself in that way can sometimes be ridiculed and, and, sure. you know, shamed, you know, so there was a lot of fear of embarrassment for a, a, a long time. Um, you know, and, uh, throughout high school, I actually, I used, when I first started playing guitar, um, I would bring my guitar to school <laughs> and play. And that was back when I didn't know a single chord. I just was like, this is what I want to do. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do it. And, you know, of course, you know, at that stage in, in life, it's everyone's going to be mean to you um, or yeah, try to sure. be mean to you. And I just figured, you know, if I can, if I can get through this, but you know, there's nothing that's going to stop me now, you know, going forward. Um, and I just kept with it, kept going. Um, and uh, yeah, then. So you kind of, the guitar kind of, you kind of took an, on an identity with that guitar, you know, being, being your sidearm or your Lance going to school. I find, I find that, you know, very interesting and very, you know, very, very admirable. I mean, I wish I grabbed onto some things uh, earlier. Like uh, we all have our regrets, right? Yeah. Grabbing onto things earlier and then, you know, following your passion uh, uh, until it morphs into to talent, <laughs> you know, uh, and there's a lot of, a lot of hard work that goes into. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. It, you know, it took me a, a very long time to get to where a point I was, you know, happy with where I felt like I could, I could do something with this. Um, but it was definitely something I felt really confident because I loved it so much. Um, right. you know, there was no, it was no question that, that this is what I was going to do. Um, and of course, you know, being that age, you know, as I got to be 15, 16, what, you know, what are you going to do with your life? Where do you want to go to college? What do you want, you know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing, you know, cause I still grew up, you know, I was born in 92. So, um, you know, it's still around that kind of that's what you do. You know, you, you, you go to school, you go to college, you get, you know, you get a job, you get married, you do all these things. Um, and for me, it was just, I want to be a songwriter, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, of course would be warped and people like, Oh, here's the rock star. Here's the, you know, they'd say things like that. And it was kind of like, no, it's, that's not really what I want to do. I just, you know, write songs that, that, uh, that I'm feeling and, and, you know, sort of, uh, express myself that way. Yeah, I, I found the same thing when I was when I was in my early twenties. I used to write a lot of poetry. Um, you know, I still have the book that I wrote stuff, and once in a while, I'll go for a laugh and look at it. But it was a way to kind of, for me, to express something that's inside that can be kind of cryptic and not mm -hmm. direct. Yeah, uh, and that's what I liked liked about poetry, and and hopefully try to get some girls with it. But it never, <laughs> that never that aspect never worked out. But it was a, yeah, it was a good release, and that's. And the one thing I'll say about songwriters, what I really appreciate, is you're able to articulate in music a lot of the emotions that we were, we're all going through and maybe not able to articulate it uh, in that way. Anyway, that being said, tell me about how the song Where It's Quiet came about, which our audience heard uh, coming into the program today. Um, so a lot of the times um, when I'm writing a song... Uh, it's not like I, I can just sit down and just write. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't gotten to the point where it's a really like a, a craft that I've mastered, which um, I know it's going to take a very long time to do. But a lot of the times I will stumble across, you know, if I'm thinking um, or if I just see something or watching a movie, something like that, um, I'll get a title in my head. And that's kind of where it starts. Then it just okay. kind of snowballs from there. So with where it's quiet, that's a kind of exactly what happened. Um, I was, I had been recording, um, and putting out a few songs and a few singles and a lot of people, um, you know, when I would play at shows, uh, you know, would compliment my voice and, and, and say, you know, it's like a lullaby, you know, it's like you're whispering, you know? Um, mm. and to me that clicked, you know, like uh, I am not a flashy, uh, person. Um, I'm very kind of keep to myself and that's kind of just where, where it's quiet, just kind of clicked and i was like that's that's the name of the song that's going to be the name of the ep and mm. you know sort of be the you know the head front for it so, so so what was your first experience in okay i can put these chords together i can put these words together for me it happened to be a parody about my wife's 50th birthday 
uh, which I had my nine-year-old daughter at the time, <laughs> your age, sing along with me. She was my crutch. Oh, that's, was, that, that's, she, that sounds great. <laughs> she was great. I was, horrif- I was horrified. It yeah. was, it was, anyway, it's, I've told the story before. Is that a Hibernians in East Islip. My wife is pissed because she didn't want to party. <laughs> And I started singing when the food came out. I mean, everything. Oh, God. You know, it's just, oh, God, it was like crazy. What was your first experience really getting out in public? Um, Tell me about it. You know, I had friends that were, you know, it's it's funny because we uh, we loved, I'm a a big video gamer. You know, I like to play video games. So, and back then it was uh, the uh, rock band had come out and guitar oh, sure. hero, yep. you know? So, uh, and I had at the time the house that I was living in had a ni- really nice, like big basement. And so friends would come over and we would play rock band. We had the drum set, we had the guitars and, <laughs> um, you know, I think it started, you know, kind of like, I, I can sing on, 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 on this game. You know, I can, I can, I can do these songs. I can hit some of these notes and okay. I'd already started, you know, playing guitar and things like that. It was just you know, kind of fun. Um, and then I think, you know, and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write a song and I'm going to start. Um, and I remember there was a, a, a futon in our basement. And I think that's, you know, I wrote my first song and was like, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. Um, and that, again, that's just more of that introvert in me, you know, just me yeah, that but, has a guitar you know, and, a, and a notebook. <laughs> but you know what's fascinating about that for me is you took something that's playful with the gaming and stuff like that and you kind of felt out your chops. Like, yeah. oh, yeah, I can do this. And then you, you're you taking, I would assume, baby steps towards, you know, getting out of playtime, but still be having playtime and doing mm-hmm. that. Um, I got to ask you this, because I have a, a nephew, who I won't mention his name. I would say extreme, uh, in high school, extremely introverted. However, great singer, great actor. And when he got on stage, I was like, holy shit, is that him? Mm-hmm. Because he morphed into this different person and then when he would show up at my house he was the kind of guy that you know would walk in and you know the social norms of saying hello and goodbye and thank you were like <laughs> gone you know yeah, it's just yeah. it's just, it's no, just I, I don't blame him it just I wasn't was, him I was the same way I was the same way I always had issues with you know at family events for the same exact thing I was very shy I didn't want to talk you know kept to myself and then you know my first show was actually I can't remember the name of the place. Um, I know it was in the Bayshore area. Okay. Because um, I actually had walked there from my, my Babylon house over there <laughs> with nice. the band. Um, it was one of those things where this the second you hit the stage, something clicked. And to this day, the same same thing. That's how I kind of – it's getting – it's leading up to that's sometimes the hard part. But once I get on the stage, something changes where all the fear, all the anxiety, all the – Self doubt melt, just completely melts away. goes away. It's just, it's that's why I love it too. You know, it's just something like I can, I'm up there. That's that's I'm gonna, you know, show who I am. Yeah, you know. Now I got to ask you this, and and I, I hope you don't mind these questions because I'm no, very intrigued all. about the in, uh, introvert aspect of things, the creative aspect, and getting it out. And you know, when I I've interviewed people, and you know, some of the, my favorite artists like John Prine mm-hmm. or um, Gordon Lightfoot. And I'm going back in time here. Or, oh, they're my, uh, Bob, some of my James. favorites as well. Yeah, great storytellers. Yes. And I've always, what I try to, the gospel I preach of the Long Island Sound is, hey, you know what? We're going to hear some recorded music. Sometimes people will play live. That's a little risky on a podcast. Sure. Um, but I always say you got to see them live because mm-hmm. it's a different uh, atmosphere and chemistry that goes on. So my question to you is this, and I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot. No, no absolutely not. Are you able, you're in this new persona, you're on your stage, I'll call you stage persona. Okay, sure. I haven't seen, seen you live yet. Do you get into the chatter between songs or stories about it? Or are you more song to song to song type of guy? Uh, song to song. And, I, and it's not, I've always felt like, when I'm going to uh, a show and seeing a band or an artist, um, I'd never, as, as just a fan listening, I'd never, I never liked when there'd be kind of banter in between or any kind of talking okay. about, you know, I do appreciate when, when, a um, you know, a singer songwriter, an artist will go up there and explain, 
you know, what the song is about or, or, you know, have a sort of a meaningful thing. But for me, it wasn't, it's not so much being a, you know, that introvert and being afraid to say something. It's more of, I just feel like I'm just going to get up there and play and do my thing. And, and that's right. it, so, you know? So my assumption would be your mu- you're going to let your music speak for itself. Absolutely. That it does, Absolutely. doesn't need, doesn't need the appetizer of the chit chat between it. And yet no. I'll, I'll disagree with you to one point in that sometimes let me, let me put it at extremes. Sure. I've, I've watched people, entertainers perform. There could be an audience there or not be an audience there. And I'm getting the same thing. And I've seen people work the crowd to involve them to say, Hey, you're in my world now. Welcome into my world. So I find that uh, with different nu- nuances, that type of engagement very welcoming. And, and mm-hmm. I've you know, seen people uh, who do the cheesy banter, and yeah. know, it's like, oh, come on, you know. <laughs> it, I mean, you, that, sou- yeah. you, sour- I, you just soured me to the song that might be great. It, right? Yeah, I mean, if it's work, you know, if it works, then then absolutely. I mean, I, I, you know, there's been times where you know I'll make a joke or two, but again, it's something that's in the moment and has to work. Um, I've never tried because any any time I've ever tried to prepare something to say, it just never nah, it never it, works. It, it's can't. never it's, it, it's got to be in the moment. Yeah, it's got to be extemporaneous. Yeah, it, it's, it's it's true. I I think um and the, more of kind of what you said, just the kind of that cheesy banter is kind of more what I was I was you know uh, talking about was that that always kind of just never sat with me well um, gotcha. as a as somebody in the crowd listening. I, you know. Um, to someone I liked or, or, or to somebody that I'm hearing for the first time. Right, right. Hey, let's talk about the next song that you brought to the table, which is Sewing Me Together. Just tell me how that came about, and then we'll let the audience hear the song. Sure. Um, I mean, this one is, uh, is you know, kind of close to the chest. Um, it is about my parents' divorce uh, when Ooh. I was about 15. Um, and, you know, I, I never, you know, because I want to say this first, um, is I never look back at my childhood and think, you know, it was bad. I had a great childhood growing up in Babylon. Um, it was a great place place to grow up. Um, and I, I love both my parents, um, you know, but obviously they, they were just two, very two different people. Um, mm. And the song was just kind of about how sometimes I feel I have a lot of mental internal struggle Um with because it's those two i'm made from those two people you know i'm made from those two different personalities um and i think i've it's been a song that i think i've just been trying to write for 15 years you know just kind of getting the right words um and uh, having the self-awareness to write it um and yeah it's it's just a song about um that internal struggle coming from you know two different personalities that you know just don't work but you know that's nothing bad to say you know, I'm not saying anything bad about either of them. You know, they right. raised me right. They were both great parents, and I love them a lot. You know, um, it was just kind of an expression of how I feel. That's great. I'm glad you got it out. I'm sure <laughs> there are going to be a lot of people in our audience who are going to relate to this. So thanks for uh, giving us some input about that direction. Sure. So, hey, everybody, let's listen to Sewing Me Together. We'll be right back after the song. <laughs> Got older, cause I am the half of 
Hey, everybody, welcome back. Now we say, everybody, hey, everybody, you get your attention. And by the way, Matt, that song is great. I do have to listen to it a few more times. It was kind of deep. And uh, I really thank you for bringing that uh, to the table. I think sure. uh, a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, through divorce, can relate to um, how you're feeling and, and find some solace in that particular song. But during the break, Matt and I were talking about social media. Obviously, we met through social media. I think it was through Facebook. I saw Matt's posts and his songs, and I'm like, didn't know you were a Babylon guy. Not that <laughs> that makes a difference, but I'm like, this guy looks pretty interesting, sounds pretty good. I think he'd be an interesting guest. Didn't know you, <laughs> but I got attracted to say this guy might be a possibility. Tell me about, uh, and I like to use this analogy that I look at social media now, particularly when it comes to songwriting and getting songs, uh, people attracted to listen to your songs, there are two camps. There's what I'd say an older camp who are used to putting albums out. EPs are a bit of a new thing, okay? Putting it out on, on uh, you know, Spotify through whatever service, um, you know, uh, I don't know what that, Bandcamp and what have you, CD Baby. And yes. then we sit and wait. Nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And yet I've seen other people uh I, I mentioned to you dante mazzetti was a guest forty-one thousand followers during covid sang on his balcony 17th floor in chelsea every night yeah built a community como brothers prolific very talented guys prolific in putting two songs about one or two songs a month and then doing a segment of videos tell me about your experience mm -hmm. with social media and, and your thoughts on it um, yeah, I, I mean, right, right now it's the, it's the biggest thing, uh, social media. And I, I feel like, you know, um, you talk about bands, you know, uh, a long time ago, you know, that would, that would drive cross country to get their songs played on the radio. Um, and I think now it's social media is just that quicker tool, you know, it's, um, getting the people in the room. Um, and I think it's, uh, beneficial um, to artists and, uh, musicians and anybody creative or has a brand that, you know, something they're promoting. Um, it's just a very useful tool. I mean, obviously there, there are downsides to it. Um, that being that, uh, you know, you may work on content that, uh, you feel is really, really great and it may not get, you know, any kind of traffic, any Please. kind of views or likes. And that's, that, that happens, you know, it is, um, oversaturated, like a lot of things, but it's, 
I still believe that it is the best tool right now to um, even just for me, get my music out there. Um, you know, uh, I, like I've sort of said, you know, I'm not in a very flashy person or, or appealing or, you know, in that, that way where, uh, you know, I can get everybody and they're all, you know, hunky dory with me and, um, mm -hmm. happy, you know, it's, it's, I'm do, do things things a little bit differently. And I think social media, it's, is kind of the best way for me to get my stuff out there. Um, and who I am, it's a little bit easier. Yeah. Even, even when I, when I think about the early days of an example of this is, is Justin Bieber. I mean, he was, mm -hmm. he was discovered right. through tons of YouTube videos that right. he put up with his mom, I think at the time up, up in, in Canada, um, to kind of expose it. And what's interesting, I was just thinking of another guy who was a guest, a guy named Sam Wolf, very talented guy, was on American Idol. And I, I talked to him about doing, you know, the overdub videos and stuff like that. And, and he struggles, he struggles with it, you know, uh, uh, doing that. And yet what he does is, is pretty good. You know, his, his, his voice is good. And it's almost like going to the dentist for him. He's got to do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? To get out there. Um, but the yeah. other thing, the other aspect of it, is I almost look at it as a diner menu with a lot. You know, when, when, we're, when we're doing this, when we're doing the scrolling, mm -hmm. we're looking to see what's attractive, okay? Uh, and a lot of times for men, or for me, it's visual first and then audible, mm -hmm. right? So what are the tricks to that? And these are like, you know, don't do anything more than seven seconds, they tell people. I'm like, oh, my yep. God. How? You know, but then how can I interest them to hear the whole song, hear the whole EP, hear the whole album. I think that's the secret sauce that we're all trying to figure out in, in going out there when, you know, hundreds of hundreds of thousands of songs are going up to Spotify every day, if not every month, you know, how, how do you get found? And I, I think a lot of it is putting a lot of lures out there, yeah. you know, in different things. And, uh, you know, things, things are going to change. What's interesting particularly with the Como brothers, and I'm sure they don't mind me sharing this, they do so many reels, so many shorts, that they actually get paid by YouTube now. Yeah. For their content. You know, go figure, you know, yeah, oh, I got a puppy. Oop, you know, yep. This is a puppy video. <laughs> yeah, literally, you know, yeah. literally, you know. And I'm a 61-year-old yeah. man going, no one, no one wants to see me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, th that's, how, that's how I feel too, you know. Um, you know, I've never been a very attractive person, you know, I've never been skinny. Ah, come never, on, don't sell yourself you know, short. You're a hand, handsome fella. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but you know, but that, but that's exactly, you know, the downside of it. Um, and I can see why people don't, you know, agree, uh, and, uh, try to stay away from it. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the mental, like I, you know, you mentioned the scrolling, um, and, uh, you know, uh, mentally with the scrolling, you know, you will have, you know, one video that's this cute puppy and then another video that is, uh, you know, kind of a sad thing about someone, a family member passing away. And, and, and that's not good. You know, you can't be scrolling and your emotions just keep running as you're scrolling. And I think that's, you know, there's a downside to it. Um, but I think sure. just as, as an artist uh, right now, in the singles climate where there is no, it really isn't a whole lot of albums and, you know, things being put out like that. I mean, I, I can't, if you ask anybody on the street, you know, they're probably about albums or the last album that they listened to. Um, they probably will say, you know, Harry Styles or Taylor Swift, who are both great artists, but I think it's just that kind mm -hmm. of thing where you have to be at that level to really um, be able to write, an album where it's going to be listened to in full. Um, yeah, you know, I noticed agreed. that um, I had done a few singles before I did the EP and I noticed that the singles got way, a lot more uh, streams um, than the EP did. And I could see that the EP sort of dropped off where after the first two or three songs, you know, the, the, the streams and the views stuff kind of dipped down. Um, so that was mm -hmm. a lesson to me that, okay, I'm just going to do singles until, you know, there's something where I feel like I have a collection of songs that I really feel like, um, you know, at the heart of it, I can put out. Um, and, you know, like you said, with Justin Bieber, you know, there's a I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Noah Khan, um, but no, he no. he's clipped, uh, had a clip on TikTok 
Um, it was probably about 15 seconds, and he played the chorus to one of his songs. Um, and a few weeks later, he was selling out the Red Rocks. You know, so uh, it's just one of those things where it's just kind of how it is now. Yeah, who, um, yeah, who and knows? I think it's great to get your music out there. Yeah, the other thing is, too, and, and I don't know how true this is. People, like, you know, I guess we're all impatient, particularly if you're, you're from New York. You know, who has the patience to sit down and, or the time to listen to a full album of anything, you know, uh, unless you're 13 years old? You know, it's when probably <laughs> the last time I've listened to full albums over and over and over again because right. you loved it. You know, and, and I, I could rattle off the albums that I used to listen to. Um, let me ask you this, because I just started getting into this, and I think I kind of figured it out. Um, have you done any live streams uh, at all of so, your music? Um, I haven't yet. Um, you know, it's something I, I wanted to do, especially during uh, the pandemic when it was really like the in the, in the thick of it. Um, a lot of people were doing it. Um, but at that time I was still kind of writing and getting my sound together. Um, I see. and I think, um, it's definitely something I want to do. Um, but I also don't want to get too comfortable in, you know, playing shows in my living room, you know, cause yeah, in, the clo- in the closet, so uh, to speak. Yeah. Right. Because if I start doing that and, and, you know, gather any kind of a following in there, I'll never, <laughs> I know myself too well. I'll never you know, play a show outside again, you know what I mean? And right. I, I don't want to put myself That's in that. It's a dangerous that, thing. Right. And I don't want to put myself there. And I think, um, it's definitely one thing if, you know, if I'm promote, if I feel like I want to promote a song and, you know, we'll do like a midnight live stream, you know, leading up to it. That's something I think would be doable for me and something I feel comfortable with. Um, but it, you know, it's hard. I, and I, I've seen people do live streams and, um, it's definitely tough. Um, it's just something that I feel like right now it's, um, just something I can work up to. Yeah, I know. I know. Like a lot of what's interesting, a lot of the established artists, at least the ones who were guests on my show, started doing um, live streams during uh, the quarantine at a necessity <laughs> of just performing, right? Yeah. Uh, and figuring out the technology, and then I've noticed that they've kept up. Every so often, they'll do a live stream, and it, to me, it really appears to be staying connected to their fan base and their community, and you know. Uh, talking about whatever uh, and, you know, responding to people in the chat. And, oh, hey, Billy, how you doing? It reminds, when I was, I'm dating myself. There used to be a show called Ropper Room. And she used to talk through a uh, bad mitten racket that had no strings in it and say, oh, I see. That was her wonder, whatever. I see Billy and Jane and, you know, <laughs> staying connected to the community. It's a one-way thing, so to speak, but there is that typing. And I think there's a good um, connection with that, particularly when, I think a lot of people struggle with being in community, you know, mm-hmm. especially when we were, we were isolated, you know. So uh, at the Long Island Sound, we've actually uh, we've done a couple of showcases at the. I'm doing a plug for myself because this is not about you, Matt. Like I said no. in the beginning, it's really about me. So as long as you know that, uh, <laughs> we did a couple of showcases at uh, Fire Island Vines. We got two more in May. Got to come down May seventh, um, and we just do like a Sunday afternoon for two or three hours. And Mike Nugent plays with the Blue Moon Man. Yeah. We usually have another younger artist play in and, and do a set uh, either by themselves or, you know, the band can can back them up and stuff like that. But I started doing live streams because uh, the venue operator said, hey, can you do the podcast live? And you never say no. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, you know, and then yeah. I <laughs> pulled Mike in and we think we've got something because it's almost like uh, the Ryman radio show you know that they do down in nashville where they're talking about you know chock full of nuts coffee in between in between songs or you know i'm talking about the venue hey come on down that sort of right. thing so uh once once the warm weather really comes through we're going to be looking for other venues to go and do this and you know sometimes you just need a, a shiny little lure that's a little bit different than yeah. uh than, yeah. than people are looking for so and there I go talking too much. So my apologies. no, that's okay. It's a podcast. It's your podcast. <laughs> that's right. And you know yeah. what? I'm glad. I'm glad you realized that right off the bat that I'm in charge <laughs> and you're just a vehicle for my amusement. So uh... <laughs> hey, let's talk about Honey Bee. Tell me about that song. Okay. And let's have a listen to it. Okay. Um, so uh, this was the first song I think I wrote for the EP, um, and I felt. Like this was about just sort of me being a people pleaser, um, you know, never really 
being myself um, or trying to sort of going back to that, that control thing, always control the, you mm. know, the conversation, control myself, making sure I'm not saying too much or saying too little or, you know, um, cause I'd always be afraid of, you know, saying the wrong thing or, or something that someone could possibly disagree with and then this confrontation. And, you know, so mm. I've always felt like growing up it, you know, I was a very big people pleaser, which, um, you know, you do that long enough, you kind of lose who you are a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so this song is just kind of about, you know, um, being a people pleaser and losing yourself. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's listen to Honey Bee. We'll be right back. some sleep Oh a chance to dream Hiding among the We're back, everybody. Steve Yusko here with Matt Stoll. And Matt, I've been wondering about this. And what I find so interesting, what's happened over the years with recording music, you've got a studio basically in your iPhone these days. How do you approach the recording process? And was that a hurdle technology-wise for you to 
to do it and how do you approach it? Um, I mean, I, I've, I've worked with a few different, uh, producers, um, and I've, I've recorded a few different studios. Um, okay. and it's always about the right fit, um, at the time for the songs that I'm want to record. Um, okay. you know, um, cur- re- more recently, uh, I've been working with, um, somebody who's in actually in my band is a guitar player, um, who's, you know, been recording and, uh, you know, went to five towns and has all that background and has his own, you know, studio. And, um, since the, you know, these most, the more recent two songs that I put out were more, you know, solo acoustic, just sort of me and my lyrics and the acoustic guitar. Um, Mm -hmm. it was easier to do that, um, with him. Um, somebody who knows uh, my music, somebody who's been playing music with me for the last couple of years, um, and knows nice. the songs. Um, and before that, I, you know, I worked in with a producer in a, in a, in a bigger studio when we did the EP and, uh, a few singles before that, when I sort of got back into music, um, and performing and, and things like that. Um, and it was, a you know, so the two different, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I interrupted you. So you're not, you're not basically laying tracks down on your own, maybe just to flush out the song, but you're not laying tracks in a home studio and then sending somebody off to mix it. You're really going the whole studio route. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, uh, my band member who records is, you know, it's more of a home studio, but, um, uh, it's the, the process is still the same. Even when I went for the, to the bigger studio, um, is I'll have the, you know, I'll get the title in my head and I'll start writing lyrics and I'll start recording voice memos on my phone and, and I'll take videos to kind of remember what I'm doing and just kind of go back and forth until I have something where I'm like, okay, let's, you know, let's track it and we'll pick a date. And, you know, for the most part, it's been, you know, in all in one day, which is great. Um, but you know, for my folk songs, it's, they're pretty simple and easy, you know, easy going. So, um, but yeah, the, you know, the last two songs that I put out were more just me and the acoustic guitar and, and, uh, my lyrics. And, uh, when I was with the bigger studio, it was more full band. Um, and that was a little more, you know, a little more difficult just because of trying to get everyone on the same page and the same date, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, but, uh, we pulled through and had some great songs in the EP. Yeah, you know what I find interesting, and I really learned this from Mike Nugent, was I have no idea about the, the whole recording process. And what his role, what's interesting, so he's a musician, obviously, and he's worked with Josie Bellow and Linda Sussman and a bunch of people. And what I, and this is my take on it, is Mike's the kind of guy who brings in the different talent to help round out the song and nudge it a certain way with the artist, mm-hmm. you know, based on really not only the fact his chops and playing multiple different instruments, but his ear and what, what he's hearing. And I tell you, it's so mad. When I go over his house, he's always working on something, you know, in front of the board. He's like, Hey, hey, check this out. Look what I did with this and stuff like that. And yet he takes those tracks that are laid down and he passes it off to somebody else, a guy named Kevin Kelly, um, who's got actually teaches um, studio production, professor Kelly, and, uh, you know, he puts uh, certain things on it to, to, to make the – to blend it, you know, together. It's just, just a very interesting process, and I would assume from an artist standpoint, you know, you got to let go at a certain way and, mm-hmm. tr- and have a lot of trust, you know, because yeah. you're giving birth to this song and, you know, you want it to be the best – image of what you had when you put it together, I guess. Right. And, right. And, right? and that's, that's, you know, as I mentioned, you know, about working with different producers that were right for me at that point in time, you know, for that, for those particular songs, um, you know, you, I had someone that was, um, you know, uh, brutally honest, but, you know, in a, in a very good way that I needed, you know, I needed someone to, to come in and say, Hey, this is, you know, you have to be level headed. You have to be clear in what you're saying. Um, and I think that changed a lot of, of my songwriting. Um, when I first started recording music again, um, the first song I brought to this, you know, to the producer that I worked with, um, he was like, this is, there's so much, it's so abstract that no one's going to know what you're talking about. You know, where I was coming from it thinking, oh, this is poetry. These are beautiful words on a page. And it just, and he was like, I have no idea what you're, t- what you're trying to say. Um, and he kind of, I remember the day we first recorded, um, and he was like, just kind of 
was like, well, what are you trying to say? And you're like, like tell me literally oh, what you, you know, what, what are you literally trying to say? And that flipped the switch. And I think really made me a better songwriter because it just became get rid of all of the, you know, the, the fancy words and trying to sound smart and just what's, what's in here, what's inside, what are the, you know, what are you thinking? Um, and just write that out. And that turned me into a much better songwriter. Um, whereas now I feel like I'm a little bit more seasoned in that and my ability to write that way where it's now it's, I'm recording with my buddy and my bandmate for the last two years. Um, and it's a little more kind of relaxed and, and, you know, both not, not that either it was bad or good, but both, you know, it's just very, they're two different, um, you know, experiences that I have that have, uh, you know, been great for me. Yeah. It's interesting. It, and I, I equate it to uh, a producer being your musical spouse and hear me out on this. Cause I remember talking to somebody and, and, you know, uh, I would say, you know, oh, my spouse is, you know, she's pretty brutal, <laughs> pretty direct, you know, and, this guy, it. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. And he was like, you know what? A good spouse tells you what you need to hear. Not always what you want to hear. And, right. and I think that's similar to the experience. And maybe that's true about, Hey, this may, might be a nice sound bite here. This is, might be a good producer. It tells you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Yeah. So we get to hear what we should hear. Right. And, th- and that's, that's their job. You know, they wouldn't be doing their job right if they weren't, you know, that's, I've always felt like that. You know, I know people sometimes they don't like the criticism. They don't like the, the challenge. But for me, it was like, this is, I've, I've made my bed, you know, this is what, this is what I'm going to be doing. Um, I'm going to do it a hundred percent or, or, you know, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank God for those people who get, you know, put in your way to, uh, to kind of, kind of help you, you know, redirect your, your thought process and, and your, your, uh, development of the muse and the songs. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, let's talk about, um, the last song you brought up. Perfect, perfect looking people. And I did listen to that on my drive home. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about that. Um, it's, you know, really just about my struggles with my self image, you know, and, okay. and, uh, more of what we previously talked about social media, you know, it is, it is about the, um, the self doubt and the imposter syndrome and all of the feelings that you can have when you're just kind of, you know, sitting on your, in, you know, for me again, that I'm an introvert and sort of a homebody and, you know, if I'm not playing a gig, I, I usually I'm home, you know, right. Sure. Um, and, you know, it's sometimes it's, it's hard to watch, um, on, you know, as you're scrolling on Instagram or Facebook or any kind of social media that people out having fun without you, you know, um, <laughs> and you start to get in your head. Why is it that this is the way, you know, uh, you know, is it something wrong with me? Am I not uh, yeah, outgoing enough? Or, yeah. And, and I think that's kind of where I was like, OK, this is something that, you know, I deal with a lot and need to sort of get out and express and um you know uh it was just one of those songs that again i had the title and it just kind of took off from there you know it's interesting the and somebody uh, told me something you know uh about facebook and other things he goes that's that's the envy machine and right. you know what I, I you know and i'm telling you it goes through my mind too come you haven't been on vacation in a while Damn, these people always look like they're on vacation. Yeah, Man, they <laughs> buying be, houses. They must or, be ro- rolling yep. in the dough. But yep. it, that's it, that's the image, that's the mask to a certain degree. Uh, yeah. You know, not to belabor everybody, but I'm still envious. Yeah, but, no, uh, I, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> We're human. You're allowed, you're allowed to feel that way, and I think it, it is tough to see people achieving things, um, you know, while you're still on your journey. Yep, exactly. But you know what? We're all on that journey, and we've got great experiences along the way, even through the struggles. So, uh, Absolutely. Let's listen to Perfect Looking People. We'll be right back. Check it out, everyone. straight line this endless dream I'm tired of always feeling it's outside my reach 
when it all goes wrong I'll stay at home Scrolling along I see on my phone Those perfect looking people From another screen Wasting all my time From who I ought to be Those perfect looking people off the ground Drinking in all the love I wish it could be me Why can't it be me? Why can't it be me? The hardest thing about it Is I believe I am no good And I should leave With the way I look Is it in my mind Can I take a break Leaving it before Those perfect looking people From another screen Wasting all my time From who I ought to be those perfect looking people Your feet off the ground Dancing with all the love I wish it could be me Why can't it be me? Why can't it be me? Am I free? Am I free? To wonder if, to wonder if My heart is meant for this Perfect looking people from another street, wasting all my time from who I ought to be. Those perfect looking people, perfect looking feet off the ground, drinking in all the love. I wish it could be me. Why? Hey everybody, we're back, and Matt Stoll is still here. He has not left, so that's a good sign. You know, I've only <laughs> had a few guests run off the program as I talk to myself. But Matt, I got to tell you, what a pleasure it was listening to your music, understanding, you know, hearing a bit about your story, and uh, and how transparent you are in your music with whatever struggles. And I think. That's what our audience is really going to gain from this episode to say, hey, you know what? I see myself in, in Matt Stoll's song. So it's so good to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for listening and having me. All right. So everybody, you got to check out Matt Stoll's um, music on Spotify. If you're listening to this on the Spotify exclusive, hey, Matt's going to get credit if you listen to the songs. If you have the paid Spotify version, you get the full song. If you're doing the free thing, you're only going to get a 30-second teaser, and then you're going to go, what the hell happened to that song? So you're going to have to go to Spotify and download some of that music and uh, put some nice love and ching in the box, you know, if that's what I'm saying. Anyway, hey, Matt, again, great to have you. Uh, look forward to meeting you uh, yes, in person. Yes. And uh, until next All time. Right, great. Everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for joining us today. I appreciate the time you spent with us. Please subscribe and comment and visit us at gigdestiny.com. Till next time, be generous with your joy, keep your spirits high, and let the music take you on a journey. Be well. Peace. Peace.